Good morning. He is risen. Hallelujah. He's alive. Jesus is living. That means that we have hope today. All his promises are true. And we have a purpose for now and for the future. And that's the great news about Jesus' resurrection. As we look into the book of Mark, we've been going through the book of Mark on the race to the cross in our series, and and here we are, the comeback, the finish line, the victory. But first, think about this. Have you ever had anybody, in a big way or a small way, break their word? Hmm. Maybe it was something small, maybe it was a, uh, just an acquaintance that, that didn't come through on something, or maybe it was a coworker that said, yeah, anything you want, I'll always be there for you, just call on me, but then you get the flat tire, and you really need that person at that time, and they're unavailable or inconsistent. It can hurt. When a friend breaks a word, it can hurt when you know that you've broken your word to somebody else as well. And it's, it's a bad feeling. It's a shameful feeling. And it's a real problem. I was talking to a neighbor recently um, that said, you know, we really don't know each other anymore on this block because since COVID, we haven't really been out and, and talking to each other. And so I really don't know everybody on the street like I used to. And it's true. I feel the same way since I was a kid that we got to know each other a lot more and there's a lot more public trust among people. A Pew Research poll from just a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, 2019, said that 79% of Americans fear that there is declining trust among citizens before COVID. And 71% say that they cannot trust or they feel like there's less trust today than there was 20 years ago, so around 2000. Do you agree? And they cite uh, the polls, the people that were polled, they cite like uh, the government or they cite institutions that have let them down. They cite uh, social media, they cite just general trends in how people are being raised and society and policies. Whatever it is, there's declining trust and you can agree with me that it's hard enough to trust. But it's even harder to find somebody that is trustworthy. It's hard enough to trust, but it's even harder to find that person that's trustworthy. I wonder if the disciples were feeling the same way after Jesus had made all of the great claims that he made. Remember those claims? He said the kingdom of God is here, it's present. Um, uh, There's this age that he said he's bringing forgiveness, he's bringing restoration. And he had this beautiful vision for people and the world. He said, Love your neighbor as yourself. And he taught. He said, love has no one greater than this, that that one would lay down his life for his friend. This was the vision that he was casting, and his disciples bought into it. They believed him, and they saw him changing lives, as we saw in the book of Mark, driving out demons. He was feeding the hungry. He was was giving hope to those who who were hopeless, the sinners. He was forgiving them, and Mary Magdalene was one of them. Mary had seven demons, the Bible says. And these demons had to have tormented her, brought her into dark places. They they made her do things with her body that she shouldn't have done. We don't know exactly what the demons did, but she was demon-possessed and she had no hope in her life until her Savior came and drove out those demons with the power of his word and gave her new life and gave her light and gave her hope. She was just one of many disciples that followed Jesus because he changed their life forever. And now she and the other women around that cross watched their Savior, their Lord, their Rabboni, teacher, be put to death. They watched as their teacher was taken down from the cross, cold, dead body, wrapped up. And so was Mary's hope. Because the one that rescued her from the demons was now sealed in a tomb. And perhaps her hope was also dead and sealed in that tomb as well. What if the demons came back? Who would rescue her now? It's in that moment 
that Mary and Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Salome, said, we're going to honor him one last time because if he's going to be dead, at least we can honor him and carry on his memory or carry on kind of the, 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 the heritage that he gave to us because that's the last thing that's alive. And so they waited until the Sabbath was over, which is a Saturday. And the sun goes down on Saturday, which in the Jewish day begins a new day, and the Sabbath was finished. And so they go into the market on Saturday after 6 p.m. when the shops open up again and they buy sweet herbs where they're going to anoint his body. They're going to go to the tomb and they're going to put those herbs on his body to honor him. They get up early on the first day of the week and they go to the tomb forgetting maybe in the head fog space that they were that there was a huge stone that was blocking the tomb, like a 400, 500 pound boulder, and there were just three of them. And so they said to themselves, who's going to roll away the stone? How are we going to honor this body? But they get closer to the tomb, and lo and behold, somebody was already there. Somebody had already rolled the stone away, and in shock and awe, they thought to themselves, I wonder who could be there, and how did they roll the stone away? Was it Joseph of Arimathea, the one who donated this tomb? Was he there? Was he doing maintenance, or was he honoring the body already? So they run up to the tomb, and Mary goes into the tomb, And she is shocked. There is a young man sitting there in a white robe, and this messenger says to her this, Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus of the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus keeping his promises through the words of this messenger to Mary, whose hope was was destroyed at his death and had been sealed in that tomb? But now this messenger's news for Mary is there is hope. There is rescue over your demons, and the demons can't come back and hurt you because Jesus is alive, hope is alive. Mary, do you see that? His resurrection changes everything. And, and the women were terrified at first, it says. They were confused and, and, and they didn't want to tell anybody, but we find out later that they did tell people. They had forgotten that Jesus said, put this on your calendar. He said it again and again and again in the latter part of his ministry, especially the second half. He told his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be put to death. But on the third day, I will rise again. And it's just like that part of his message had just been like turned off in their brain because they're all shocked and amazed that he actually came back from the dead. And they couldn't believe it. And Mary was one of them. But the angel said to Mary and the other women, go to Galilee and he will meet you there just as he told you. And he did. And they did. And they saw Jesus in flesh. Mary saw him in the flesh later that morning in the garden. And in Galilee, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to over 500 disciples all at one time. And you might be thinking, this is just a story because this is too good to be true. Well, those disciples didn't think it was just a story too good to be true because when they saw them in the flesh, they staked their life on it. And, And many of them, if not all of them, were eventually put to death for what they saw with their own eyes. And Jesus' resurrection is, is cemented in the blood of the martyrs because they didn't die for a story. They died because Jesus is alive and Jesus was there and they saw him and they touched him and they ate with him. And Jesus is alive, my friends, today. This is the rest of the story. Jesus ascended into heaven and we learn in the scriptures that he's returning again and he's taking you and me to be with him to give us new bodies because he is risen We will rise again on the last day. And when we die and when our loved ones die in Christ, the truth is, the Bible says, is that our soul goes to live with Jesus and wait for that day until this body, this body that's breaking down, will be raised again in perfect heavenly glory. That's good news. Don't miss, don't miss the message. Don't miss what Mary missed and the woman missed that they forgot. Jesus does everything just as he tells you. Where do you meet him today? How can you meet him today? 
Before Jesus left his disciples in John chapter 6, verse 63, he says to them, I'm keeping my promise to you, and I'm going away physically, but I'm staying with you in a very real way. He says this, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. That means his word, the message of this book, the Bible, is with us. And when you hear his word, his spirit is at work, and he is present with you. And he has never broken a promise. He's never made a promise he has, can't keep. At the very beginning of time, this is the message. You and I were created never to break our word with God and God never to break his word with us. We had perfect harmony. Our, 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 our parents, Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, lived in that harmony, lived in perfection with God. There was trust. There was, if you took a Pew Research poll back then, it would be 100% trust between God and us and us and God. But this is what happened. Satan tempted us to break that trust and we broke that trust. We took what was meant for God and we took God's word and we said, no God, I don't trust your word. And that's the story of the fruit in the garden. Not trusting God. But it's in that moment that God made a promise and he said to us, I'm sending a head crusher. I'm sending one who will restore trust restore a relationship with me, and that person is the Messiah. And God makes promises and comes through. That's why the angel says to Mary, and the angel says to you and me, there you will meet him in his word, just as he told you. I say, this is the interactive part, I say, just as he, and you say, told you. Ready? Just as he told you. Okay, we can do better. Just as he told you. All right, here we go. God preserved, kept his promise by saving the war, humanity in a worldwide flood through Noah, his family, and the ark. Just as he told you. God took a childless, elderly couple that had no children and had no chance of having children and gave them a child of the promise called Isaac through whom the Messiah would come. Just as he and that son had children, and that those children became tribes, and those tribes became a great nation, and that nation thrived until they were put into slavery, but God delivered them out of slavery in Egypt and gave them the promised land so that the Messiah could come, just as he told you. And that nation was established. They had kings. This king started off good, but then they went bad, and they led people astray, and they started doing idol worship. And the line of the Savior and this promise was in question, but God sent prophets like Jeremiah, like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, to the people. And he said, you haven't kept your promise to God and you've committed spiritual adultery against him, but God is a faithful husband and God loves you and God never makes a promise he won't keep. And so the Savior's coming and Isaiah said that the Savior, by his wounds you will be healed. Your transgressions will be forgiven in the future through this Messiah. And God remained faithful just as he... You're getting this, aren't you? And then he arrived. Jesus of the Nazarene, the messenger said. And by his perfect life for you and me, he never sinned. He was always faithful. He always kept his word to God. And by his wounds, just as Isaiah said, you and I are healed. We're forgiven for breaking our oaths for breaking our commitments to God and to one another, for not being the neighbor that God has called us to be, for not being the parent God has called us to be, for not being the child or the employee or the employer that we're supposed to be. Jesus died to take away those sins, and by his wounds you are healed just as he told you. And then he rose from the dead so that you and I have a new life, a life that's shaped by grace, friends, not by more laws, by grace, which is forgiveness, God's riches at Christ's expense. And because he lives, we have no fear in death. We have only heaven to wait for, just as he told you. And when the budget's tight and the bills are stacking up, we can hear our Savior's voice because didn't he tell us he'd be with us right here? that he takes care of the birds of the air, he feeds them, and he clothes the grass of the field, 
So how much more do you think that he's going to take care of you today in your present struggles? Just like he told you. And when the doctor's visit is bad again and again and again, and our bodies are breaking down, is not his promise that he's giving you a new body? Is his promise not that he answers all things according to the will of God, the one that loves you true, just as he? So you're going to be confident today. Not confident in yourself, but confident in the way that he is shaping you. And he's shaping your life. Because we see Jesus shaping our life. This past week, uh, this week actually, today is wrapping up the Texas Children's Houston Open. Any golf fans in the room? I don't know if you watch any golf or you went to the tournament this week. I was a PGA Marshal for a couple years before this in Austin, and I was invited to to go out and to volunteer to be the Marshal uh, this last week. And so I took a couple of uh, mornings to be out at the golf course and watch the world's best uh, golf in Houston. It's quite, quite incredible. I'll get, let you in on a little secret about PGA Marshalls. We are very average people. I'm a hat golfer, and I'm out there, and I'm around greatness. There is some training that's involved, but really to be a PGA Marshal, you just need to volunteer, and you just got to give some time and do a little training and be kind. Your job is really to help players in the gallery or the crowd help them interact or help them not interact, uh, try, to keep, try to keep the players playing and try to keep the crowd quiet and happy as they're watching the players. It's kind of fun. You get to talk to a lot of people. The neat thing about being a marshal is that you get one of these. They're credentials. And an average person like me gets to wear credentials and stand inside the ropes just because I have a piece of plastic with my name on it. That's it. Nothing special about me. But I get to stand inside the ropes. Sometimes when the caddies or players talk to you, you can talk back to them and you can interact with them. You have special privileges. In fact, I was a little shocked because I'm just trained for hole 16, Marshall, and this says that I have access to clubhouse, locker room, (laughs) players dining, practice areas, hospitality, media center, tournament office, AA, all access. I'm not sure if they printed that correctly, but I I had no reason going into the players' locker room. (laughs) But I had access to it, and that was kind of neat. Now, hole 16 is a, is a par 5, 576. And so a lot of players, in pro- professional players, they try to drive and get on in two, right? So they can get what? An eagle. They want to try to get an eagle. So they, they have these monster drives, and very often their monster drives will go too far or, go, or slice or, or do something that they don't want it to do because they're being aggressive. I was on the fairway uh, on Thursday morning, and a lot of the balls were going outside of the ropes, which as a marshal, then you have to clear people away, take the ropes down, and you have to clear, clear people that are coming, stop people that are coming so the player can play. Uh, and and as I was doing that, there were two balls off the tee in this group that went into the trees, off into, into the, uh, the grass outside of the cart path. And so I took down the ropes, I marked the balls so the players knew where they were, I helped them find them, and then the crowd started to come. And the players are getting ready to hit, I'm like, oh boy, here they come down the cart path, and then there's this cart that's coming right down the cart path in front of them. I noticed it because it was a different color than uh, the green carts, it was orange, and I thought, that's interesting, and then uh, the, the crowd came, and I looked back, and I, I did this. This is called the pastor blessing pose. And at church, it ends well. This means that you're receiving a blessing from God. But you know what it means on the golf course? Stop and shut up. So I did the pastor blessing pose as, as, on the golf cart path because the crowd was coming, and here's this golf cart. Golf cart pulls up right in front of me at my toes, and I look back, and he's getting ready to hit his shot. And I look down at the golf cart, and it says, Jim Crane. And I thought to myself, Jim Crane? gosh, that sounds familiar. I didn't know that name. And then I said to myself, as after they hit the shot, maybe it was the Astros orange, I thought to myself, Jim Crane. Oh, like the Astros owner, Jim Crane. I got it. Okay. That'd be funny if he knew, I thought to myself, that there's this guy driving around in a golf cart at the Texas Children's Houston Open presented by the Astros Foundation, that there's this guy that has the same name driving around in a golf cart 
And then, because you know it's opening day at, at Minute Maid Park, so he must be there. And then all of a sudden, the second player, actually he asked, this gentleman at that time asked me a question and I directed him to the, the next player. And then it dawned on me as the players gave their clubs back to their caddy, they didn't go to the next ball. Where did they go? They went right over to Jim Crane to shake his hand and thank him for inviting them and letting him, them play in his tournament. Now, who was I to be stopping Jim Crane, the owner of the Astros? I'm just a person, an average hack. It's the credentials that give you the power, the authority for 15 seconds to tell Jim Crane to stop at his own tournament. The message of Jesus and the resurrection is this. You and I are sinners. We're nobodies. But because he gave his perfect life for you and me on the cross, all that he has, his full access to heaven, are yours. And he says in his resurrection, I'm giving you my righteousness. I'm giving you my holiness. I'm giving you the full access to heaven. Not because you've earned or deserved it. You're inside the ropes of grace. And when God looks at you, he sees your name where Jesus' name should be. And Jesus' name where your name should be. Because you can have the assurance that your sins are forgiven. You can stand inside the ropes, not because of how great you are, but how great he is and what he did for you. And that changes everything. How do we get this access? We get it when you hear the word like you're hearing it this morning. And faith starts to sprout in your heart. And maybe some of you are right there, right now, wondering, how could this be true? It is true, my friends. And that feeling, that faith that you have in the message of the word that creates faith is the message of Jesus. There he will meet you just as he told you. And listen to this. Some of you might be, might be wondering, where can I feel? Where can I touch grace? Actually, Jesus comes to you through his Holy Spirit and the all-access pass is given to you through faith that's created in water in the Word. That's why, as you read about baptism in the New Testament, it's always connected some way, shape, or form to God's promises, and especially to his cross and to his resurrection. Like in Romans chapter 6, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was, here it is, raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This means something very applicable as we close today. It means that we're buried with Christ in his death. That means that this all-access pass says that you have no more sin. It's buried with Jesus when he died on the cross. Therefore, your mind is transformed and you say, now I'm living according to the credentials, so I'm going to fight sin like I've never fought it before, that I'm forgiven. I've died to it. I can't live in it. I'm li living within the ropes of grace. Just as he, it means this, that you also are raised with Jesus when you're baptized. That faith that's created. You're raised with him because he was raised from the dead. Therefore, your thoughts are not going to be dead thoughts. They're going to be resurrected thoughts. Do you get what I'm saying? They're going to be thoughts that say, I used to live for myself, but now I'm living for others. Because Jesus loved me first, I'm going to love others first. Putting my needs and desires aside and putting my neighbor's needs, my spouse's needs, my family's needs, my neighbor's needs, number one. And when I do that, resurrected thought, I'm praising God and honoring him and worshiping him just as he told you. There may be growing distrust today, and we can see it all around us. But there's no doubt, there's no doubt that you wear the credentials that Jesus has given you. His perfect life, his innocent death, and his resurrection are yours. And all of this is because of his great love and grace. And all of it is yours, just as he told you. Amen. Amen.